We now have a live virtual keynote address from Periyasami Kumaran, Special Secretary for Economic Relations and Development Partnership Administration, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. Other ministries, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to speak to you on a topic that holds immense potential to reshape economy. Although I'm unable to travel to Bangalore and join you, I'm glad that I'm able to share my thoughts with you virtually. The annual Global Technology Summit, or GTS, as it has come to be known now, is among the few flagship track 1.5 foreign policy outreach initiatives at the Ministry of External Affairs through the Policy Planning and Research Division supports and collaborates for. The last edition, which was the eighth edition of GTS, was co-hosted by MEA and Carnegie India in December 2023 in Delhi with the theme Geopolitics of Technology. The next edition of GTS is expected to be held sometime next year. However, given the importance of rapid developments in technology, which has become a key input into policy making in government and the private sector, we thought it was essential to maintain the continuity of this innovation dialogue and workshops so that all stakeholders in the technology domain continue to remain engaged. I would therefore like to congratulate Carnegie India for putting together this dialogue. The themes at this dialogue are very relevant and topical, including those on DPIs, AI, and technology partnerships. I'm going to speak today mainly on DPI. Friends, over the past decade and a half, DPI has evolved from a conceptual framework to a tangible practical force catalyzing unprecedented innovation, driving improved public service delivery, and promoting greater economic inclusivity and development. Today, the DPI model has emerged as a key Indian value proposition and is being adopted and adapted by countries worldwide. It is now clear, based on our own experience during this period, that for DPI-based solutions to work optimally and to produce the kind of outcomes envisioned, we require three key aspects to come together, technology, governance, and community. Technology creates the digital systems, technical protocols, and applications that provide the building blocks. Governance is critical in facilitating user adoption at scale by establishing trust. Governance frameworks may include rules of engagement governing stakeholder behavior, cross-cutting and domain-specific norms, laws and policies. And governance embedded into digital technologies. Finally, vibrant and broad-based community participation is essential to enable value creation. This includes private sector and civil society actors who can collaborate to unleash innovation and unlock value. DPI can play a transformative role in a number of areas. These include financial inclusion, small business empowerment, as we have seen from ONDC, transparent delivery of citizen services, driving blockchain-based financial services, unified lending platforms, We've seen this in the case of ULI, uh, which is currently uh, being introduced, and central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, smart cities and urban development, telemedicine and health data systems, digital voting and real-time policy feedback, integrated lifelong learning platforms, energy efficiency and climate action, public safety and security, disaster response, smart agriculture, supporting the gig economy and micro-entrepreneurship, and supply chain transparency and food safety management systems. 
Many of these ideas are already under implementation, but more will come on stream in the months and years ahead. With the integration of AI to make better sense of the huge amounts of data generated, DPI can become the backbone of an interconnected, more efficient and inclusive digital society. I'm sure we will hear more on this from Dr. Pramod Varma, the next speaker. Friends, allow me to make a few points on the intersection of DPI with international cooperation and the global impact it can generate from the vantage point of the Ministry of External Affairs. As new technologies emerge at a rapid rate, they risk benefiting a select few and perpetuating a digital divide of sorts. As India advances in its DPI journey, we are committed to assisting other nations in adopting and scaling digital public infrastructure. The potential for DPI to drive global progress is substantial if supported by the requisite level of international cooperation. India's successes provide a strong foundation for us to assist the Global South in developing and scaling its own DPI initiatives. The following are key ways India can play a role in supporting the Global South in DPI development. Technology transfer and knowledge sharing, promoting the adoption of open source technologies. Number two, advising and capacity building on data governance policies and cybersecurity cooperation. Number three, advocacy for global standards in DPI. India can advocate for interoperable and open global digital standards in the relevant forums, ensuring that DPI developed in the Global South is compatible with global systems. This could help with cross-border collaboration, especially in trade, finance, and health. Fourthly, digital innovation and startup engagement. We can encourage partnerships between India's own thriving digital startup ecosystem and entrepreneurs from the Global South to co-create DPI solutions. This could include accelerators, incubators, and collaborative funding mechanisms. I'm glad to note that our partners among the developed countries and multilateral institutions are fast recognizing the importance of promoting DPIs. Building on the global understanding and efforts in DPI and its own experiences, India focused on DPI as one of the key priority areas during its G20 presidency in 2023. The G20 consensus on DPI encapsulated in the leader's declaration represents the first such internationally agreed understanding on the concept, description, and applications of DPI. This includes a G20 framework on systems of DPI and the global DPI repository. India also announced the creation of a social impact fund for accelerating DPI implementation across the Global South and agreed to contribute an initial $25 million. In addition, the DPI approach has received endorsement at the SCO, Digital Ministers level, the Quad Leaders Meeting, and the India-EU Trade and Technology Council. This was also reflected in the Global Digital Compact adopted at the UN-hosted Summit of the Future last month. Multilateral financial institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank have also unequivocally endorsed the DPI approach. A number of countries have already signed MOUs with India for the deployment of India Stack DPGs. Back in July 2021, Bhutan became the first country to adopt India's UPI. Since then, UPI has been steadily adopted or operational linkages established elsewhere, including in Sri Lanka, Mauritius, Nepal, UAE, Morocco, and Singapore. We are extending under our ITEC program, several capacity building opportunities to government officials from the Global South to help them develop a better understanding of the concept and relevance of DPI platforms 
and the regulatory and legal reforms required to make them work. We are also actively engaged with a number of countries bilaterally to extend assistance in DPI as part of our development partnership programs, be it through lines of credit or grants. Depending on the needs of the partner country, the DPI platform could be hosted on secure servers based in that country or hosted on cloud-based infrastructure. Friends, despite the immense promise of DPI, challenges remain. Ensuring privacy and data security, addressing the div digital divide, and building trust in digital systems are critical. Additionally, there are governance challenges, such as ensuring transparency, accountability, and inclusivity in the development and deployment of DPI. However, these challenges also present opportunities. India's experience with large-scale digital transformation offers useful lessons for overcoming these obstacles. By investing efforts in fostering cross-border cooperation, promoting digital literacy, and ensuring that DPI systems remain open and inclusive we can unlock the full potential of DPI for global development. I look forward to hearing more about the outcomes of your deliberations and on ways to take them forward. Thank you very much. Address, your address has set the context for the next keynote and panel. We are now delighted to have Pramod Verma, co-chair of the Center for Digital Public Infrastructure, de deliver a keynote address on the past, present, and future of DPIs. Okay, thank you. Good evening. I think the uh, speakers before me has set this up exceptionally well. Uh, very, very well set up for the 20 minute or so. I have, okay, you're readjusting to 80 minutes. All right, 20 minutes, I have, uh, to speak about little bit of past, current, and most importantly, where we are going with this. I think the idea of technology for societal development is not new. It's been there. And India has been, um, for the people who are not familiar, you know, India's really largest, most populous nation on earth, 1.4 billion people, 22 official languages. There's no single language that binds us other than maybe English but it's only for the top of the society. And this d diversity necessitated India to look at slightly different way to create non-uniform but unified uh, infrastructure for diverse solution and inclusion. While inclusion was the primary agenda, inclusion of large section of the society was the primary agenda we also balanced innovation. I think that, that was an interesting learning that we got in. And the first 10 years, or so, 15 years, we primarily focused on three things. And they started with our identity project. I don't know if it's wrong. Okay. Okay. What did that primarily drive is the formalization, the initial formalization of the society. So the identity starts to become the starting point of people to be recognized in the system. So a system to recognize their people, identity plays an important role, registries plays an important role, attestations plays an important role. So we started doing that, and it's not only India. If you look at Morocco, we have here folks from there who led that project, or Philippines, very large number of pe people who have been starting to bring into digital identity to work. So digital identity actually grew from nobody having an identity to a billion people having identity in about six years, six and a half years in India, right? So this was a massive formalization. But that's not the purpose of identity was not to give identity. Purpose of identity was to provide products, services on top of identity. And that's where we moved into the next layer of transformation with primarily with respect to financial inclusion. And that drove from bank account opening, access to accounts, and most importantly, access to payments. Both P2P, P2M payments, but even more importantly, G2P payments. India continues to be a large part of Indian budget, continues to go towards the subsidies, 
and it's, you know, it's grown over years, quite large amount of subsidy. And the ability for the government to give subsidy on time to the right people has been a huge obstacle in India. And one of the things that we did as part of the G2P infrastructure is to create world's largest G2P rails. And now that set of infrastructure that is used beyond G2P, by the way, but it is one of the large, what government continues to be one of the largest use case. We transferred about 450 billion US dollars over the last decade to more than, you know, a, nearly a billion people, 960 million people. So it's, it's a very, very, very large program that is driving, plus the UPI here, Prompt made the prop in Thailand or PICS in Brazil. We have Brazilian friends here. Massive P2P, P2M payment infrastructure beyond the cards. So the, in, in addition to cards being expanded, we also expanded the QR code and other base payments, mobile base payment, right? But what it did trigger is the idea that, and this, this is a very, very interesting learning from India, that Indians were fast becoming data rich while they are still not economically rich. So they, as pa they participate, 500 million people participating in digital transaction, digital payments, UPI today, 500 million people participate. Whether you are receiving money, sending money, you are creating digital trail. And the digital trail, if unleveraged, remains locked in to systems. So one of the big shift that India made in 2016 with Nandan Nilkani's seminal talk on data democracy is about shifting that mental model that maybe we must relook at the idea of personal data, digital footprints, as an economic asset for people to grow their own you know, progress, to make their own progress, whether it's individuals or SMEs having the ability to harness their footprints to be able to drive access to products, access to capital, access to services and so on, access to opportunities in general. And that drove lots of discussions around credentialing data, uh, open data infrastructure. Not open data doesn't mean public, I meant access to my personal data. And if you look at UK and France and so on, open finance, open banking, these are not new constructs, but India has been actively investing in such infrastructure in India as well, as part of this journey, because this was one way to bring formalization further so that they can get opportunity, access to opportunities, capital, products and services. But what we are realizing though, this is a past, this is what we are doing today so far, is that all these stepping stones were great, but not enough. So we had to reimagine the next possibilities because, again, people are move, movement of people, movement of goods, and movement of money is actually not restricted to geographies. And that continues to happen whether you constrain a little bit because of geopolitics, eventually it finds its way to be able to manage, because that's how you, you know, the world is uh, continuing to grow. And it might be, whether it's in East Africa region, West Africa region, whether it's India or India, uh, you know, uh, South, Africa, South Asia region, it doesn't really matter. This movement of goods and movement of data and movement of money has to be unthrottled. And unthrottling has to happen by putting individuals and businesses at the center of a design. And these three elements were the essence of much of what we do when we think about DPIs. One, ensure every digital, every digital transaction allows individuals, businesses, things to identify themselves. Their ability to prove who they are is an integral part of initiating a contract, a transaction, transaction or interaction. So identity is who am I plays a very key role. It's not about individual identity alone, it's a business identity, identity of things, identity of anything that is transacting in the system. 
And then subsequently, we also focus a little bit. We talked about data as asset, but we are still not there to convert real world and digital assets to be transactable, trustable and transactable. The today's assets are very much in paper world. That means if I have a battery bank or a, a agriculture crop, they remain very, very, very low transacting nature because of the inability to trust, inability to verify, inability to transact, inability to lend against and so on. And if every bank has to do that repeatedly, the cost of doing that is very high. So it is important for us to convert assets into a verifiable, transactable, low cost asset. This is a very fundamental shift in large cross-border, low cost, high volume trade scenarios. So that's an area that we have to focus, but these two are only enablers for something what everybody wants to do. Convert my asset and identities and data and money and everything else into be able to trade or transact or interact. That's why I think a lot of us are actually starting to look at what does it mean to reimagine DPI globally as well. And that's where I think much of the discussion today was very, very relevant for us to be able to create global standards, global technology interoperability, and global. And now you can, on top of that, you can actually program geopolitical constraints. Now, there might be regulatory or regulatory or other constraints that allow a bank or an individual not to transact with a particular country. That's okay. We are not being opinionated. We are saying that those pro rules can be programmed on top of a global infrastructure. That infrastructure, the idea of DPI, again, goes back to the three layers. A globally interoperable underpinning driven by safe, scalable, affordable, open technology. On top of that, all highways need rules of the game. You can't lay the infrastructure without rules. So you have to be able to program those rules, KYC rules, counterparty checks rules, PML rules, and so on that you want to be able to program on top of that. Of course, you need to be able to do that. And then drive, allow entrepreneurs to drive innovation on top of it, because that's where the real unlock of value will happen to the society, not in the bottom two layers. They're just enablers, much inspired by internet, no different. So when you look at the idea of standards, protocols, interoperability, decentralized nature of it allows the same idea, architectural inspiration of the earlier efforts that we have seen that work at humanity scale. So we, are, we have to continue to push that agenda towards digital identities, digital assets, and digital transactions that we must be able to enable. But one underscored or less talked about, and yesterday we had a fantastic session in the afternoon, is the idea that DPI is not about government. DPI is not about centralized government-funded project. We are not talking GovTech. We are not talking e-governance. We are talking the idea of building extremely minimal infrastructure that allows market to innovate. So the story of DPI has been about private innovation. Entrepreneurs finding no different from internet. When you create that impetus, when you create that playground, you entrepreneurs rise up to recompose, recalibrate, create new applications that otherwise we could not have imagined before. Why? To cater to the large population in the long tail that allows them to actually part start participating. And that brings the three core pillars of DPI thinking. Policy, policy alone won't cut it. Policy combined with globally interoperable infrastructure. By the way, when I say infrastructure, it can be just a set of specifications. Nothing more, not even software. 
you guys can build software idea is to create global interoperability and trust layers at the bottom but these two on balance itself you need a real ingredient into that is the innovation for market so combining these three ingredients in a smart fashion so that one is not overdoing the other too much policy with no infrastructure will remain legal too much you know infrastructure means you are actually eating into market innovation possibilities but if you leave everything to market you have a alternate problem competition problem you know monopoly problem and other issues that will you will have to eventually deal with so how do you balance this is a no perfect answer it's a something that you need to constantly calibrate but that's the essence of dpr essence of dpr is to calibrate that and then push for the next generation now i'll speak about three things that we want to cover globally and that's where the global partnerships global efforts global standard or specification discussions must go towards that is to allow going in one country at a time to go beyond countries to go cross border to actually unlock that possibilities and one of them we are very focused on is converting data as an economic asset i talked about it today much of the cross border customs paperwork or identity itself when you travel a student traveling from here to europe or us eventually carries paper we are back to using paper because there is no other way we are able to carry verifiable data trails verifiable credentials that i have to the next country so we are going back to very silly mechanisms of paper paper with original paper paper with seal signature wet signature which is just not scalable because you can fake everything so i think you if you want a high trust low cost use a control mechanism you need to go back to asking basic questions how do we convert data affiliations achievements credentials transaction trails into cryptographically protected non tamperable proofs proofs that individuals and smes can carry so that when i contract with the counterparty whether it is across the border or domestic both can trust each other and transact at a low cost high volume we are working on a paper so if you are interested in contributing you will be attributed fully you can actually join this is an open source effort just putting our thoughts together you can scan if you want to and then actually contribute to that uh, paper this paper actually reimagine what is data as an economic asset and how does data flow work personal data flow i'm not talking about bulk data and so on my own things the fact that i worked in a company as a driver the fact that i worked in a company like uber the fact that i have a reputation score of 4.9 how do i harness this and make sure that is portable and verifiable very simple powerful imagination that you can participate in contributing then we are actually asking the question that alone is not enough we also need to push beyond credentialing into tracking of provenance provenance tracking of some of this when it comes to scope 3 when it comes to climate financing when it comes to lending global lending if you want global lending path flow paths to open up you need to be able to actually tokenize them not only credentialize them you need to be able to tokenize them i'm not talking particular technology i'm talking about idea of tokenizing beyond credentializing to be able to lock transact trust and actually go cross border there is a very powerful paper this is not an indian effort at all by the way some indians are participating but other than that it's not a india government effort or anything it's a truly global effort that actually started from between basel we launched in washington and we are actually doing this because this is an imagination of bunch of um both regulators financial regulators and technology is coming together to create a uni much more universal infrastructure that allows assets including money and data to be able to actually move much more freely in the control of the user so very very interesting possibilities emerge you can scan that there is a global sandbox that is coming up 
okay, I need to get extra minute just because this damn thing doesn't work. Okay, so uh, we are actually doing design, this global sandbox that has come together, very large financial co co institutions around the world and other regulators are participating. If anybody wants to go check out this, completely an open source effort to design specifications, protocols, specifications, and an architecture, not software. Software will be written by private marketplace. So this is not an effort to write the software per se. This is to write the architecture and the specifications and the protocol, interoperable protocols that allow the market to create the next generation and cheekily called FinTernet, as big as internet, financial internet, right? So go for that. Go check it out. And I, mean, I want to bring back this picture because both we talked about data and tokenization. We are still dealing with these two, identity and assets. We still have a big question in our mind in terms of transactions. And that's because, especially countries like India, man, this is tough. Okay. In, in, it's just, this formalizing the economy has been a very hard problem for us. That's because we are in this mode. This is, I did not put India there because India is exactly the same thing. All digital transaction systems are under 10 percentage penetration, including B2C commerce, one of the largest you know, investment that has gone into the country. Less than 10 percentage. 90 plus percentage of 1.4 billion people are still transacting informally. Informal economy creates very low performing, high asymmetry, high cost, inefficient, Micro economies, very local economies driving. It will never give the boost for any country like India. And this we see across the globe, across global south. Now there is fundamentally there is an issue because of the extreme context variance. This is what we are seeing, inability for us to unify through a single platform. That's because single platforms don't. If the single platform, one commerce platform actually does 90% of our B2C, we might have a monopoly issue, but it's never happening because of the extreme diversity and scale we have. So what, one of the things that we have been asking ourselves, what did internet teach us? Internet taught us that internet is a network of platforms. It's not one platform. Internet is not one platform. It's a network of platforms. Could we reimagine what originally, you know, the... Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee wrote the semantic web and a transaction web beyond the content web that we experienced in the last 20 years. It is absolutely a possibility. This is a World Wide Economic Forum paper analyzing what we call an open transaction networks. If you want to read, you can read it. There is significant effort. And I'll then, then close it out on the AI because we have further discussion coming up with another panel is that why AI, as Seth was talking about, is a supercharging of DPI. We don't see AI and DPI as a DPI plus AI. It's a DPI to the power of AI because we cannot get the next billion people into the transacting economy unless we close the access barrier. Access to knowledge and information and access to interactions with the computing. We are investing, some of you are investing in the voice and other technologies precisely to get the next billion people to be able to go beyond entertainment world to transacting world. This is very, very key for us and that's why we are investing in many of the efforts that you see in India as well. And we'll see this across the world. Oh, in conclusion, very simple. If we repeat what India repeated in the last 15 years, one use case, one system and one country at a time. We'll take, we'll all be dead and gone, 100 plus years, and yesterday somebody argued that this will never happen. No, forget 100 plus years, you're optimistic. It will not happen. So maybe repeating what we did is not what we want to do. We want to be able to think even bigger. That's where our global coalition is gonna come into picture. Because one country, one system, one use case is not how we want to put it. We want to be able to think like internet. We want to think how does universal infrastructure with the user at the center starts playing out so that countries can program their rules 
rather than invest in bottom up everything people just onboarded them them into internet can we do that is a very important question and this is why i think we believe india especially india i can speak for india for sure or maybe 7 billion people 250 million businesses around the world needs technology uninhibited access to technology may not be cutting cutting edge but definitely uninhibited access to technology and i think technology needs india there is no other way we are going to see any value out of it so thank you so much the panelists are hilda makatambula digital transformation advisor to the east african community russell waruba deputy Se secretary for digital government government of papua new guinea Nouruddin Boutaia, President, Moroccan Foundation for the Promotion of Preschool Education. Kamal Podal, Under Secretary, E-Governance Commission of Nepal. Ramesh Raginani, Executive VP, Software Engineering, Salesforce. Hello, everyone. Thank you for sticking with us uh, for what's been, a, what's been a long day, but hope to have a really good discussion today. Um, I've been requested to just kick off with a few kind of opening remarks or thoughts before we dive into this incredible panel and globe, truly global representation across at least four continents that we have here. Um, I think the main kind of uh, thinking that you might have or the misconception, I guess, you might have at this point is that DPI is uh, somehow an India-led journey around the world and it's an India-only story. Uh, and we're here to debunk that myth firmly. I think, uh, I think the power of this uh, is that it's truly been adopted around the world. And the reason that it has uh, is because, as you know, Pramod and others have been framing, it provides GDP level impact, but that can be palpable at a human level, right? Uh, and what we mean by that is when you look at the numbers or the scale of, or the speed of the transformation, you're quite excited by that. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, a woman local to her village um, even with this fancy technology backend system, may not know the details of the technology backend system. All she knows is that you know she can use a feature phone to give an instruction and, and do a voice-based transaction in, in her language, maybe, or, or to send money very easily. Or someone uh, you know who's going to school or getting a medical record gets it with a, a small little box that they don't fully uh, uh, you know. Uh, haven't really registered immediately, but it's just black and white dots. And that powerful QR code, which is a printed small two by four inch uh, on the piece of paper, on a human level just completely changes the nature of the paper that she's carrying, right? And so I think what we're seeing is that, that that ability to do that transformation is something we've seen around around the world. And there's lots of different models for the way in which this has been adopted. So if you look at ID, for example, um, you might have in some countries, uh, like in India or in Thailand, the main identity authority runs its own identity authentication. In a country like Bangladesh, you have a private entity called Parichoy that's built electronic KYC. In a country like Chile, you have an institution like Clave Unica, which has built an eKYC module that's completely separate from the civil registration department, but has connected with them and made that API openly available. Right? In payments, you see so much diversity. In EAC, which we'll get to in a moment, you see uh, the prevalence of telcos as players in this space. Um, in others, you know, in India or in Braz uh, in India, you see a lot of fintechs on the front end. In Brazil, you see neo banks leading the charge. Actually, so the diversity I think that we've seen uh, really shows that while we talk about DPI like it's one big umbrella, um, there's actually a lot of ways in which this has been tailored and customized at a country level to drive this impact. And I want to get straight into the panel to sort of understand from the countries that we have represented, you know, in order, Morocco, India, Tanzania slash EAC, can I call you, <laughs> East African community, Nepal, uh, as well as Papua New Guinea, to get a sense of their stories. Um, so maybe, maybe I can start with, who do we, we can start with Kamal maybe. Uh, Kamal, do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe one of the big success stories um, that you're most proud of in, let's say, digitization as a space, and what are the lessons that you've seen from that? It doesn't you know, have to yet be a DPI, but what, what are the real takeaways for people here that are looking to think 
on how they can deliver this in their country, uh, in their context, um, uh, and of that success story. Uh, thank you, Kamma, for your wonderful questions. Uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, the political commitment is most important thing in order to drive any, any digital or whatever transformation you wish to implement in your country. That's why uh, in, in my country, in Nepal, I think the first important uh, initiation uh, is uh, actually, um, uh, I think it would be in 2008. And after 10 years, it, it, I think it, it had happened, you know, uh, because we established the a separate department for national ID and vital registration, mm -hmm. and and this is responsible agency. We we mm -hmm. de define de actually designate the responsibility to this organization and clear role and responsibility. That's why, and then it, uh, it could functional now. And I think more than uh, one, uh, I think 15 million people are have already enrolled in the national ID system, mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is a great milestone for us mm -hmm. uh, for further uh, uh, innovative. Uh, adaptation of this kind of uh, DPI uh, because we know that in DPI there are four layers. Uh, in my country only we have so far two layers. One is identification that is I think mitigated by the national ID um, but still it is not universal coverage. Uh, and the other is the payment layer we have. But data exchange layer and the consent layer is not there. That's mm -hmm. why still we are working on these two layers. Mm -hmm. I hope uh, within a couple of years, we'll be able to establish these fundamental principles uh, in, in order to operate this DPI framework. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lovely. And, and Hilda, maybe you can tell us a bit from the East African community as a region, uh, across the eight countries, of course, uh, what, are, what are the major success stories that you're proud of as a region, and what are the lessons to take away from that? for any large-scale transformation. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Kamiya. I think, um, yeah, we all know mobile money is one of the good success stories from East Africa. And um, it started like a Kenya case, but currently it's a regional case in East Africa. Um, around 2021, we heard um, mobile money registered account a thousand, w w 1,106 registered accounts per southern adult population. Wow. So um, that is above, um, compared to, to, to Africa, it's 600, but also compared to Asia, which at that time it, was, it, stand, it stood at around 500 and, and Latin at around 240. So I think we are ahead. And um, looking how, why are we successful in that area is just the way we think. Like um, this was across the globe, it was all about uh, uh, cards, MasterCard, you know, and banks, traditional banks. But the good thing in East Africa was to be able to bring in the telcos. You know, at the beginning, like a few years ago, nobody would think telcos can, can, can be helpful to financial inclusion. But being able to bring in the telcos have made a huge difference. Now financial inclusion, like for Africa, for Tanzania or Rwanda or East African region, um, banks like mortar and brick banks, it could have been very hard to go to rural areas because for private sector, there is no business case. And in our, our population, 65% is still in rural areas. Mm -hmm. But we had a very good um, success on mobile, pay, uh, mobile penetration. So that was a very good, um, I think, way of thinking, trying to, to understand the problem and try to solve it, not just uh, lift and shift, mm -hmm. you know, trying to understand the context in a region and come up with a solution that will work or customable solution to our region. I think that yeah. was part of the success. Fantastic. So actually, bringing in a new type of actor was really one of the big takeaways, which is very powerful as a lesson. Monsieur Boutayeb, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what Morocco is very proud of in its transformation and how it got there. Thank you, Kamia. Uh, I think no doubt that uh, the, the success or the, the experience we are proud of it is, uh, is our couple national population register, unified social register. And uh, we, the, the idea began uh, or we began uh, working on that uh, since 2013 because we have this problem of universal uh, uh, subsidies that are not fair, that goes to rich people more than poor people. 
and so we try we 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 were looking for something and the 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 the, the key was to have a uh, an id uh, which which could be uh, uh, could could identify people, but also authenticate them. So it could be the the, the, the key to go there. And so by trying to 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 f to think about that, we heard about uh, the Indian experience in 2016 at Har. So uh, we first invite uh, the first director of Udai, Mr. Aras Sharma, to come to Morocco. And uh, we uh, give it lots of questions, like, uh, uh, <laughs> and he, and he, we were we were uh, re uh, really surprised. He has re uh, answered to all our questions. <laughs> <laughs> so we came, we came here uh, first. I sent my CTO, and after uh, at that time I was uh, a minister in the Home Affairs Department. So I sent my CTO, and after that I I uh, presided the delegation. I, we we came here. And we go around the country, uh, Delhi, uh, Bangalore, Vijayawada, uh, Mumbai, to see how it used, how it is used. Because it's important. You say that we have to. to what are the key of success? The key of success first is to listen to mm. and to, to, to understand. Mm. After that, to go and see uh, experience to see how they, you distribute rice, for example, this five kilo per person, per family, uh, uh, in, with GPRS, not, not even 4G. Mm. So you have the capacity to, 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 to adapt mm -hmm. to technology too. So after that, uh, we noticed that even India, you, are, uh, you, 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 you seek for technical assistance for, for uh, PWC and EY. <laughs> so we, yeah. I returned to Morocco and I asked for uh, uh, joining PWC and EY Morocco and India. <laughs> and they, 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 we had PWC accompanying us. And so we did the job. When I was in Bengaluru, I met uh, Mr. Pramod and even Mr. Mr. Nandan Nikani and he, 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 was, he made me a proposal. Oh. We had 30 minutes. <laughs> and he made a proposal to build, to write a deep digital public goods. That came massive after that. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I, I'll be uh, on this, uh, uh, I, I'll okay, accept this proposal. It has to meet my timeline. It has to be, I have to own the code source after that, the source code. And the third, if you are able to maintain during three to five years, mm -hmm. because it will be written. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't know if it uh, mm -hmm. will work. And we signed the MOU 2018. And uh, now our system is working. We have about 21 million people enrolled in, 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 in the national uh, population register. And on top, it's not like here. Here you have directly uh, users that are uh, government department users. Mm -hmm. We have what we call unified uh, social register where our families with a scoring that mm -hmm. help other departments to see how to. Mm -hmm. So this system is working now and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a way okay. We did the pilot. I think it's, it's necessary to do a pilot. We did the pilot in two cities and it's, it's, it was to monitor our system. Mm -hmm. Is it good? And how uh, what is the, ti the, the, the time ne needed to enroll one person because that will size your, 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 your experience. Overall. So now it's, it's okay. It's just the first layer of our DPI. Lovely. No, and, and it sounds like the lessons go beyond make sure you have a pilot to actually, what I'm hearing you say is try something new. Try something that maybe hasn't been done before because you were the first yeah. country in the world that actually did that. So They, they came to me <laughs> last year yeah. and they said, when you say Mozip, we say Butayab. Why? <laughs> <laughs> and they say, because you are a risk taker. I yeah. say, what? I, I take a risk, but it was calculated. Risk. Calculated risks. Yeah, uh, I love that. I love. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, lovely. Come, let, let's come to you, to you, Russell. Do you want to tell us about maybe some of the success stories that Papua New Guinea has seen? What are the lessons for others here? Sure. Thank you very much. I bring you all greetings from our beloved country of Papua New Guinea. 
We are right in the Pacific Ocean, just north of Australia and attached to Indonesia. We have a population of around 12 million, uh, very rugged. We are the most linguistically diverse country in the world, 800 languages um, wow. and 1,000 tribes. So just imagine what that means politically for our leaders. And we have five years to put everything in place and to deliver something by the end of uh, 2027. So hence, uh, we, we established the, the department, the ministry, and uh, we, we put in all the legislative framework and the policies, and uh, we created our own GovStack, our own uh, government technology stack that, that uh, aligns everything we do and how we interface with business. And without knowing, we actually had a, had a layer which was called building blocks. Um, and then, uh, you know, we reached out to ITU and we found out that they're actually DPIs or DPGs. <laughs> so, um, payments and ID. And in just 10 weeks, 10 weeks, uh, we, we developed our own digital ID and uh, we launched it last Thursday uh, with a wallet and um, with a portal with seven citizen facing services pay your water bill, um, pay your children's school fee, um, and, and uh, you know, utilities as well. So uh, police clearance. Um, so it's just basically um, adoption for us. And you know, we went to, we went to Bhutan and we just white labeled the ID. And, uh, we, <laughs> and, and you know, like for us, um, we needed to have quick sprint cycles to get things out on the market. And over the last uh, few days, we have up to 2,000 subscription. We're putting an operational model around it. Uh, and it just goes to show that um, you can achieve a lot very quickly if you know exactly what you want and have the right partners to do it. So we are, we are very, very fortunate. Um, I was just speaking about my secretary and uh, he just told me that learn as much as you can. The thing that we need is to have assurance. You must have assurance if you are deploying a cloud technology platform, infrastructure as code, you must have assurance for that work. If you're going to do DPI work, you must have assurance. Let your agencies at the sector and at the, and at the cross sector, you know, do their business process mapping, attach it to the DPIs, mm -hmm. and then deploy. So that has been our journey thus far. And actually, you should tell the audience how long it took, because it's quite impressive how short the time. Yeah, uh, ten, 10 weeks. Um, 10 weeks, guys. 10 weeks. Ten and, um, probably took longer was, to set up the summit, huh? When, <laughs> when we were launching, uh, we invited the Prime Minister. He didn't come. Uh, I was so happy he didn't come because I was praying. I was sitting in the house praying. And I said, oh, good Lord, please let this thing be launched. And, <laughs> and then take it down, take it down after it's launched. Yeah, but, uh, Everyone's going to check being, on their phone we're now. We're stabilizing it now. We're, we're stabilizing it now. So uh, we have um, version 2.1. Which, which will be launched to be EKYC compliant by, by November. And then by December, we'll also have an extra build out as well. It's fantastic, yeah. fantastic effort to see. Um, Ramesh, coming to you maybe, do you want to tell us a little bit about the success stories that Salesforce you know, as a company has uh, built on in DPI in India? Um, where do I start when we hear so much of fascinating stories here? But Salesforce is in the journey for the last many, many years in terms of how enterprise customers needs to use our digital platform, uh, not just a digital platform, also digital experience. And just a context of India, we started our journey a couple of years ago building lending platform. And obviously, India being a billion plus population, and uh, it's going to be a third largest economy by 2027. Uh, it's a huge potential opportunity how the digital uh, modernization is happening and we are in the journey. And in this journey, uh, obviously, uh, while we're building for global uh, customers across the globe, just for India, we have, we have to integrate with the internal services in, within India. So that's where the DPI comes in mm -hmm. uh, handy. And uh, it's a scroll, walk, and run approach we have taken. Six months, even last year, the type of integration we started doing for external services to make our lending platform mm -hmm. successful, DPI is playing a very important, again, we started with other, we, we have integrated many uh, low-hanging uh, KYC integrations, whether it's uh, UPI payment integrations, or even there's many uh, integrations are in the roadmap right now. Mm -hmm. But just the way this 
micro to macro lending opportunity in the market in mm. India. Uh, with the volumes we are working with the top banks as a design partners is incredible. And, and I'm amazed by how the 10 weeks uh, you've <laughs> implemented. I really want to talk offline and get some playbook from you. But it's a good story. It's a great to hear such a complex DPI uh, infrastructure can be implemented in a, such a short period is a good playbook. Yeah. But just coming back to Salesforce, I think uh, we are in the journey and we see while we are building for global, integration with the local country within India is very super important. Mm -hmm. And where we were with the DPI integration last year versus now is completely changing in the momentum and we'll continue to go in the flow of yeah. uh, evangelizing, exploring the DPI as yeah. we go in the long-term journey. Fantastic. Again, on the panel, you see this interplay between the government and the market and you know, we keep drawing that out, but I think that's the real core of the difference um, between this approach. Um, but maybe we can uh, come back to you, Hilda, and you can tell us a little bit about, you know, EAC is, is not just, uh, it's, not a, it's a community of nations. It's not just one country bound by one set of laws. So when you're thinking about this, you know, at a regional level, uh, and therefore, by extension, you know, at a global level, because people in this room might be thinking about how does this affect 50 countries, you know, in one go. What are the sort of design lessons that you have seen uh, that actually work effectively to get a group of nations um, to all equally serve their citizens in different contexts? Um, what have you seen work? Yeah, um, thank you very much. So. I think the important thing, uh, for, for instance, at the regional global level, global level is um, thinking um, um, at the regional, thinking about standard and protocols, but um, let countries be autonomy. So mm. for instance, when it comes to the designing of DPI building blocks, let country do that. Like the design of digital IDs, data exchange systems, is it um, a payment, for instance, switches at the national level, let countries work on that. Mm -hmm. But as a regional, as a, as a global, it's very important to develop standards and protocol. Mm -hmm. This is very important to ensure interoperability. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's very important for a region or global to go fast. Mm -hmm. Because once you have all those standards and protocol, which are agreed mm -hmm. by everyone. Mm -hmm. So that is where the tricky is. For instance, at the EAC, we have eight countries. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important for all eight, eight countries to agree. This mm -hmm. is the standards that we will work on or develop our digital ID, mm -hmm. and these are our protocols, and this is what we are willing to share mm -hmm. among us. Mm -hmm. And then from there, when countries are starting developing their own systems, they will have that, they can have the autonomy to develop the way they want, mm -hmm. but following the standards and the agreeable um, mm -hmm. protocol. I think this is very important to but isn't it, sure. isn't it, I'm going to press on that a little, isn't it hard to get eight countries to agree on a standard? Like, how did you actually successfully execute that in, at, at a level? Like, what are the tricks that you can share <laughs> with, with the group here on, how do you get that, do you just start with two and then you wait for three or four to come on? Or you kind of wait for everyone to agree before even the first country moves? Okay, so the agreement will be done by everyone in the room. So, for instance, now we have eight countries. Previously, we had six. So we have eight countries. We'll need all eight countries, like experts. So we'll start from the technical level first. What can we work together mm. on this? Mm. For instance, currently, we are embarking on data governance framework. So we started to discuss with this DPO, um, head of DPOs, like, okay, there is... We need to share data. We have countries currently with their own policies, a few, mm. but some do not have policies yet. But we want to work together at the regional level. Mm. If everyone will be having restriction on cross-border data flow, we cannot work together yeah, at the regional yeah. level. Yeah. So we start that discussion at the technical level, then we'll go to the political. So once we agree at the technical level, then we can go for the political yeah. level. And then once that's approved, that means all other countries, all countries, like all eight countries, Will have I guess it's easier to, to get the engineers to agree first, and exactly. then you take it to the, <laughs> to the, <political. laughs> to the politicians. Yeah, yeah. So, so w w once it's work at the technical level, it's easy for them to convince political. And they've already made progress. Exactly. And so Ex you're starting from somewhere. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. I think also one important thing is when you're working with, ma with multiple countries, you should also know these countries will be at different level of digital development. So, mm. yeah, yeah, maturity, yes. Mm. So you'll need to support others, while other countries could just 
move, mm. um, but other countries will need more support. Mm. So you should be able to support them at least to be able to reach to that standard and protocol so mm. that you can work. Together. So then a lightweight standard is exactly. very powerful for exactly. those, that diversity. Exactly. Fantastic. So Kamal, maybe coming back to you, if we want to draw the conversation you know, closer to the potential of, of DPI, of course, uh, Nepal has implemented a lot so far already. I know you're working on a blueprint. Tell us a bit about the ambition that's unlocked or the, uh, you know, the possibilities that you see um, in taking a DPI approach versus sort of a conventional digitization uh, model. Uh, thank you, Kamba. I think uh, legal and consent layer, you know. That's why uh, we are actually drafting uh, the personal data protection law. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, this is a draft version. I think uh, India has just uh, recently passed, and then we can get some insight from that law also. Uh, I think this is one of my great milestones from this uh, in innovation dialogue, <laughs> and then I can communicate easily to my colleague. Uh, and next is, I think we face the uh, capacity constraint, you know, mm. because uh, I think if we actually implement one system and the local, uh, actually, the staff is unable to actually operate it, customize mm -hmm. it, because the interoperability and localization is are two factors that should be uh, actually um, contained on our uh, process. These two factors are necessary to implement the DPI, yeah. okay, to strengthen the DPI in the future. Because uh, today what we have, maybe in the future we may have next, you know, mm -hmm. uh, problem. And in order to address this problem, we, have, we, we may need additional information yeah. from the yeah. government. Yeah. And the, the, uh, there is one problem in understanding of the uh, data um, and the consent, you know. Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, basically, uh, government is actually collecting the data from the uh, public, uh, citizens. And citizens are going to the government office to verify it themselves. Who am I? That's <laughs> why the government is actually uh, facing a lot of problem in order to verify, yeah. you know, the yeah. citizens. Yeah. Because they already have the citizens' information, but they are actually investing a lot of in, uh, human capital, financial resources to verify them. That's why, and in order to address this problem, I think uh, the government uh, and other institutions are um, actually uh, agreed that we need to run data in order to avoid people run. You know? mm. First run the data ac across the government entities institutions, then automatically people have to stay in their home yeah. and then they can solve, they can get the public service delivery, you know, Lovely. you can easily yeah. uh, solve the people, then the, I think it will be the good and effective implementation uh, of the DPI's outcome in the future that they realize now, you know, that's why every stakeholder, private sector, government institutions, uh, political leaders, administrative bureaucrats, they all are now agreed on this. Uh, commitment that we need to invest on the DPI. That's fantastic. That's and I think, it, you know, considering Nepal's uh, rural and hard to reach areas, geographic diversity, getting to those areas would be almost impossible without sort of that DPI approach as well, right? Yeah, in a way. Yes, Super. Right. So, I, um, Monsieur Butai, coming back to you, maybe, you know, there's this French saying, uh, plus ça change, c'est plus la même chose. It's more that changes, the more the things are the same. So, is DPI just old wine in a new bottle, or, or how, how do you see it as different from the conventional approaches to digitization? Now, having implemented it, um, what, what, what are the real differences that you've seen on the ground? Uh, <coughs> the real difference we, we see, that we have this first layer. But uh, uh, we tried, for example, to, to build a, a, a citizen portal to have all our administrative procedure on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, very rapidly, we, we, have, we, 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 we confront a problem because we have the ID, but we haven't the, 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 the payment tool, the payment layer. And we haven't also how to give this uh, uh, document to our citizens. So we, have, we, we need this uh, uh, DigiLocker or this uh, QR code. Or the, so we did that, but it's, it was vertical. It was not uh, so. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I heard about what's coming here I, last May, I, I came again here. And I saw, I met with you, with a lot of people. And I, I think that if Morocco has to go on, on this journey, he had to... Uh, 
resolve this problem of payment layer because we have a large amount of cash circulating. So, and this QR code, uh, as I said yesterday, could be the key to 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 launch this this yeah. thing. So. I'm not now in, in a position of minister to impose something like I did before, <laughs> but uh, I'm a pro bono president of uh, 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 a preschool uh, foundation. Mm -hmm. And so I said, perhaps I will, go, I will do evangelization mm -hmm. to, to go through that uh, by uh, setting uh, 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 an, um, a pilot uh, on e-learning platform uh, inspired by Diksha platform here. So now we are, we signed, I signed an MOU, an MOU another MOU uh, with the Triple IT Bangalore, and we are, try, we, we are working with COS to uh, implement this e learning platform for my 25,000 educators mm -hmm. all around Morocco. Mm -hmm. But the idea, the aim is to convince the Ministry of Education to do that for its 300,000 teachers. Wow. So that could be the, the example. The second is to convince the IT department that uh, the rails that Mr. Promot said the, just before, <laughs> these rails, if they are done, will let the private sector start up and all to, 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 to innovate and to, to, to work on it. That's, that's mm. the, the aim of the not next 10 weeks, but perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Next <laughs> Russell, one year, you, perhaps, or two years. What have Russell. you done, Russell? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. No, but, but coming to you, Russell, I think maybe what, if you can tell us what the ambition, uh, you know, what has been unlocked for you, um, and, and what maybe what you've learned on the differences between, uh, you know, a DPI approach to traditional digitization. I think that'd be helpful to, to get a sense from you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, it's, uh, we've, we've traditionally thought of it as, a, as an enterprise architecture and how you drive efficiency within government, which is traditionally as a policymaker, that's what you think of. Yeah. But then, you know, discussions coming out of this, and so you've mentioned rightly so that this is market innovation, where, where you allow the private sector to come in, you know, just like the road, where, you know, the government, the private, and the citizen uses it. So for us, uh, you know, um, having having a good uh, s selection on partners, like having a good system integrator, we found that that, that makes a key difference mm -hmm. in, in how you deploy. Uh, you know, much of the success or the acceleration has been because uh, of, of the groundwork that we've done over the years. So it wasn't overnight. Uh, and I forgot to mention um, our colleagues from, the, from our National Department of Education working with, um, working with Sunbird now for for the education uh, LMS work. So um, my, my contract um, ends, ends at the end of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, while, while here, my, my secretary, my boss, sent me my target, so I'll just share with all of you. Um, <laughs> by, by, by 2027, uh, we have to have 85 to 90% 90, 90 uh, 4G coverage, 30% mm -hmm. um, 5G connected, mm -hmm. 8 million people on digital ID, Mm -hmm. um, 5 million with bank accounts, uh, 150 digital services, and we must deploy e-voting in 2027. That's when our next general election is. And, and because it's an, it's an economic um, indicator, um, w we need to increase our non-tax revenue by 30 to 50%. Yeah. And this can only happen with DPI. Mm -hmm. This can only happen with DPI. Wow. And then we need to increase our our GST by 20%, so it's this analogy of you creating the field, okay, now we're building the portal, but in the next iteration, we have to step back and allow the others to go in and play in. That's where the value is realized in what we are doing. So in terms of sustainability, um, we have worked with a state-owned enterprise to create a subsidiary that will actually monetize on the DPIs, so um, that's a good one, and we have some <laughs> targets for that. Uh, and of course, um, we, are, we are selling this to the Pacific, as, as my esteemed colleague from, um, from the East African uh, has mentioned. So we, we are the biggest country in the Pacific region. Everyone else, like Fiji, is 1 million people. <laughs> we are 12 million people, you know? <laughs> so there's exactly no reason for us not to be uh, deploying this. And, uh, you know, we, we have signed uh, a declaration across the whole Pacific. 
and uh, we were just going through the details and the nuances of that. So uh, Ilda has just mentioned that, you know, it's, it's how you coordinate and how you make standards and you let the DPI implementation be specific to each of them. So and that's a big learning for me coming here. So, um, you know, unless you have targets and unless you, the targets determine your roadmap and then the roadmap determine your partners mm -hmm. and then the approach that you need to take. So you have to, you have to know what you want when you're discussing DPIs before you come. Yeah. So I, for me, that's a very big learning and I'm very keen on the journey ahead. <laughs> very powerful framing, very clean also as a takeaway, <laughs> very clear. Um, but let's say, I mean, coming to you, uh, Ramesh, let's say the four countries around the world, uh, around you here, um, as well as maybe a smattering of like 10 or 12 in the room, they all want to implement DPI now. And they have these ambitious targets similar to, to what Russell just shared. You know, you've come from the SaaS world, you've come from this growth journey of how software has changed in its implementation. What can that you know, teach us about the ways in which to deploy uh, DPI rapidly um, around the world? See, um, in general, when you're talking about the DPI type of very deep platforms, it's important to understand what type of requirements you have, where you want to incrementally want to implement, rather than just trying to get into everything at one shot. It has to have some good structure and understanding some of the implementations here and use this as a case studies and use this as a reference playbook and, and start comparing with your requirements and then start as a first MVP, what is called the minimum viable product. And that definitely gives you a right foundation. When I say foundation, it has to be a, all the requirement, what is called as a foundation layer from powered by DPI is very important. You don't want to get to the stage, middle of the implementation and step back and redo again the foundation. It'll be too expensive. Mm. It'll be too time consuming and the project won't be in a good reputation model. So most important, most of the times when I talk to the, my customers uh, where they use our platform as a platform, and with a lot of customization, that's another big element. Don't try to change too much definition of the functionality when you take the cat and convert it into line, line to convert into cat, because some of the features, it's designed to do certain things. Mm. Because you have such a good customization as a requirements, when you don't draw the line, when to use a vanilla, when to use a customization, more you go into more customization, that will only going to make you more expensive mm. from a cost to serve standpoint, even from a duration standpoint. Yeah. So net net, just build the, sometimes you need to go f slow to go faster later, but if you rush it too much at the beginning, then your foundation won't be that good. Mm -hmm. That means whatever you build with a flaky foundation, you're only going to get into regression. You're only get into frustration of the project. So get to know your requirements, try to utilize the DPI as a platform as vanilla as possible because that's designed as a platform. Mm. And balance your customization. When you look back one year from now when the first version phase one implementation is done, you should always be proud of what foundation you built it. So that's super important as you go along. And it's actually a very, very powerful insight because when we start building, we always want to add requirements based on what comes up, right? It's very tempting to say, oh, last week we had a flood. You know, let's make sure that there is, uh, you know, extra data that's collected uh, around, you know, groundwater levels nearby and so on, right? Onto whatever system you're building. But the key thing is implementation should not be uh, completely changing the definition based on your greediness will be there, but you have to control your greediness. <laughs> control your greed, this is a good and takeaway. And then just make sure you are not changing the behavior of the features because it's all platform. Mm -hmm. When you're consuming the platform, it has to be uh, API driven and you also have to make sure the experience layer has to be well aligned to the platform capabilities. The moment you try to intersect into a different lane, mm -hmm. the game is already in a wrong path. Powerful. So don't, don't do too much. Stay minimum core to the foundation and use, use the baseline packages for the foundation. Build on top, add on top later, but don't make that the roadblock in the first stage. It's a very powerful sort of set of lessons. Um, but I think we should maybe move to some audience questions, uh, questions. 
Um, any any thoughts uh, for you can also frame who you'd like to ask uh, the question to. Yep, I see a gentleman in the blue shirt. <coughs> Good Thank evening. you very much for your perspectives. Uh, I would like to know uh, what are the difficulties you have experienced in implementing uh, digital identities? Maybe Monsieur Butayab and maybe you can cover Russell yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I can go first because a lot of problems. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Uh, in 10 weeks you have also had a problems too. <laughs> yes, so you'll be surprised how much problems there. Yeah, so um, when you are selecting um, your, especially your solution architecture. That's something, because if you are selecting, like for us, a low code, low code solution, many of them are click ops based. They are, you know, uh, server based architectures. And if you have your cloud infrastructure, we have a sovereign cloud, in, cloud infrastructure that is, uh, so your system integrator it's very key because it allows you to align. Otherwise, you'll be, you'll keep, uh, <laughs> you'll keep engaging an intermediary to make sure that it converts uh, the different architectures together. So you know that's something that uh, we are even facing, trying to make sure that um, whichever solution you pick, the the infrastructure by which you are deploying your solution is actually aligned to the to to um, whichever you've chosen. So I think that's a big lesson for me, going back uh, tomorrow. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to go and fix that. <laughs> Powerful. Monsieur, you want to? Uh, uh, yes, uh, difficulties in, uh, in uh, building this uh, ID uh, system wasn't technical, weren't technical. Uh, I, ha I, I, I faced difficulties with, uh, with two competition with another ID system mm. based on a card. So I said, it's a new thing, it's, it, there is no card, there is a, it's just digital, but we had to negotiate and uh, it, 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 it takes time. The second is uh, we, we wrote a law parallelly to, to, the, to, the, to the building of our system and before I went to the parliament to, 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 to explain and to get this law approved, I had the data protection uh, or authority that came and tried to change things in, in uh, and uh, unfortunately for me the president of his, this data inf uh, was an IT guy so <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't discussing about where I am uh, infringing the, his law, the law of data protection but he wanted to, to, to talk about architecture so I, I, I didn't accept and we Top more or less during six or seven months, we just uh, shut off <laughs> the system, and I wait until uh, uh, I have uh, uh, green light for above this uh, this authority to to come. That that's the problem. It's 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 not technical. Technical, we didn't have really uh, problems we, because we we did that well and uh, each step uh, uh, we did what he we said we we have our specification from the beginning we saw we we know where we are going and we didn't add as we go things uh, and we did the, this pilot and we have this experience here mm -hmm. because it it uh, it give us confidence one billion and two hundred million at that time versus 35 million, so, <laughs> <laughs> so but, yeah. but it, the problem wasn't te technical. I see, pa very powerful lesson. Kamal, you want to? Uh, technically, uh, i just like to take one minute to uh, ex actually, yeah, <laughs> uh, to explore your question. Uh, basically, in Nepal, we face uh, two basic problems, you know, during the implementation of the national ID system. One is the data ownership problem and data custodian problem. The, the community or the institution which collect data for one specific purpose cannot be shared with the other purpose as per the legal framework within the country. That's the major obstacle we faced. And then uh, it, it, uh, I think it takes a long time to change the legal framework uh, because we need to convince our policymaker, legal, uh, and parliamentarian. That's why it takes a long time. I think uh, this is one obstacle. And other obstacle we face is the data exchange. You know, the data exchange, and there must be some 
key information, you know, they, they, this need to be uh, actually exchanged among the other entities. Yeah. Yeah. For example, the data collected for the uh, mm, election purpose could not be shared for the other purpose, you know, and the data collected for the uh, national ID purpose could not be collected for the, could not be shared with the um, other uh, service sec like uh, social security purpose or um, the driving license purpose. Yeah. That's, this is the case. That's why we need to think before implementing national ID, this framework should be clear and then the, there should be no legal binding and legal constraint in, uh, in order to operate the whole ecosystem smoothly. Thank you. Makes sense. Yeah, go ahead. You have a question. Good evening. My name is Vinay. I'm a foreign policy researcher based in Bangalore. Uh, my question is to the panelists from Africa and PNG. How much of your work is caught up in the Cold War between the US and China? Is it difficult to surmount? Uh, is it difficult to even acknowledge in public? Thank you. Do yeah, we need to take a short break? No, I'm just joking. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so, so I think... Um, the important thing for these countries is to know what you really want. Once you know what you really want, you'll know who is the right partner to go with. So I think that's the most important thing. So either it's the Chinese who will be able to help on this case, you need to look on the opportunities and, and challenges of that, and it's either the US. So I think mostly is knowing what you want ahead of time and go with the right partner. So it's case by case basis. So thank you. Russell? Yeah, I'm, I'm in total agreement with my esteemed colleague. Um, we are very fortunate. Uh, we, we, we had a lot of support from the Australian government, and I acknowledge my esteemed colleague from Delhi who's here as well. Uh, the Australian government helped us with the policy frameworks. Uh, we, we visited Singapore, we visited Estonia, of course India, and then we saw all the government technology stack, and we said which one best suits us on our context. Yeah, so that's, that's essentially what you do. China is what it can offer. The US has a lot to offer, the traditional partner. So we are, we are very, very happy with what we have. Actually, the, the, the US government is actually funding our project manager position, and I just want to thank the US <laughs> government for their support. Wonderful. For yeah. I, think, I think we're just about at time, uh, but as a last phrase or last word from everyone, or in this case, let's give, do a last number. Uh, one, don't think you could have achieved without it, maybe. Should we, should we try that? I heard Russell give some targets, but who, wa who wants to go first? Maybe, anyone want to strike? No, before I answer that question, one thing I kind of slipped while I was giving some of the recommendations and best practices, you are dealing DPI with a very sensitive API calls. The data and the security and privacy is so important. And make sure while you're focusing on what you need to focus, also pay attention on your sensitivity of the data you're carrying. That's a huge responsibility and it's a huge uh, accountability too. So that's one thing I want to and remind you. And last everyone. number, we'll push you on the last number. Last number is, <laughs> um, you know, 150 million uh, user traffic, how we want to really make it power. Fantastic, uh, yeah. okay. Hilda, for EAC, last number? Yes, yeah, so I think, um, uh, uh, allowing or facilitating the movement of people and goods and services, 80% at least. 80%, lovely, fantastic. Kamal, last number? Uh, I think uh, because of the increasing uh, digital literacy in my country, I think around 60% uh, have already transacted through the banking, uh, financial transaction through banking account uh, and mobile banking system. That's why I think uh, cross-border transaction uh, that we uh, recently established the memorandum between uh, India and Nepal, I think it, it has already enforced, but uh, it is one way only. Because yeah, Indian yeah. can actually enjoy uh, in Nepal, they can pay from their phone pay or uh, um, UPI yeah. system. Uh, but in Nepal, we, we cannot pay. That's why yeah. I hope so cross-border uh, transactions cross -border transaction yeah, is well. the <laughs> greater milestone after this yeah. DPI. Lovely. Okay. And Russell, we heard yours earlier, but yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to summarize it now. So it's the it's the power of one. One. If, if one. you can if you can get one citizen to benefit. Wow. The, the citizen that. doesn't need to stand in line. The citizen <laughs> can vote online, doesn't need to do all this, then we've done our job. Well, that's yeah. a fantastic note to end on. Thank you, everybody, for your attention today. Thank you.
ಇದು ಏಷ್ಯಾನೆಟ್ ನ್ಯೂಸ್ ನೆಟ್ವರ್ಕ್ ಪ್ರಸ್ತುತಿ ನೀವು ನೋಡ್ತಿದ್ದೀರಾ ಏಷ್ಯಾನೆಟ್ ಸುವರ್ಣ ನ್ಯೂಸ್